after my last camping trip, uh, the truck got pretty muddy, so I'm going to start this trip off nice and clean. And check it out. One of the advantages of uh, driving down to Tucson quite a bit is uh, you can see over on the right, I-10 headed towards Tucson. There was an accident up here, so they're backed up big time. So, but I had no, I knew about this frontage road, and uh, I knew this would save me some time, so I got off the freeway. And uh, just up there at Picacho Peak, I'm going to get back on the freeway. When planning this trip, I wanted to stop by some old ruins, and a, it's an old ghost town called Sasco. And uh, I've heard two different stories that it, a lot of it's closed down, private ownership now. But, uh, yeah, my first plan, as you can see, did not go as I had hoped with all the rain. The uh, little bit too much water for me to try and get across. And without somebody to help pull me out if I got stuck, I didn't uh, think it was worth it. Well, since my plans for Sasco didn't work out, I decided to come over here uh, a little earlier than planned. Uh, this is an old abandoned Titan II missile silo. Uh, it's it's uh, abandoned and uh, the desert's kind of taken back over. But it's an interpretive trail. So we'll take a quick look at that and then I will find some place to camp for the night near here. This is all on BLM land. And then tomorrow morning we'll head over to just south of Tucson and check out uh, Titan Museum. So yeah, that's going to be fun. All right, we made it to this uh, abandoned missile site. It looks like we're not alone. Looks like they were camping. But anyways, yeah, uh, this is going to be... Oh, there's some storyboards. So this might be pretty fun. Anyways, uh, let me get parked, and we will hit the trail. Check this place out real quick. L let's check this place out from the air a little bit first. Uh, off in the distance, you can see the storm that's passing through. That's going to be the direction of Tucson. And, you, and this is all BLM land and just how beautiful it is after a storm passes through. And somewhere out there, I have to find myself a spot to camp for the night. Some dispersed camping. Maybe up that road a little bit. It doesn't seem to be anybody else out here, so I shouldn't have a problem finding a place to stay. And you'll see, though, there's a that's a uh, operating mine right there. All the tailings from that. And then we have the the abandoned missile site that we're going to walk around just below us here. So we're going to walk around that loop. Oh, starting to sprinkle a little bit on me. Hopefully it doesn't last too long. I don't know if the GoPro is picking that up, but the, the sun shining with the rain, that's pretty. All right, also here's the other hard stand I guess they were talking about. Ooh, this is not gonna be too easy to read. Launch complex. So I think these were built in, uh, yeah, in the 60, in May of 63. And uh, from what I read, they shut the Titan II program down in uh, 84, 1984. Part of a deal Reagan made as we're modernizing our missile systems. But let's see if I can get some idea here. So we're right here. And that would mean the silo is going to be down that way, which will take a walk down there. It's getting kind of dark. Hopefully the sun comes out. So here, there's a control center. Wow. And there's a, a museum, a Titan II museum down 
south of Tucson that I was, uh, I'm hoping to go down to see. This is the missile with a mission. Wow, it's hard to read these signs. They've been out in the sun for a little while. U.S. Air Force. No missiles were ever launched from this site. Oh, here's a site. Site active, 1960 to 1984. Yep, that's kind of what I read. 327 pounds, 327,000 pounds, 103 feet long. Um, and they were accurate to within three quarters of a nautical mile, so one statute mile. They are accurate. Oh, good. Sun's starting to come out. <laughs> a proud place in history. Wow, look how big that thing was inside that silo. Oh, hold on. Are you guys seeing there's a little bit of a rainbow over the top of those signs? Cool. Hopefully the GoPro's picking that up. But it's growing right now. Desert is just so beautiful. So beautiful after it rains. I don't know if there's much that beats a desert after a rain. Yeah, and there's another, I know, I looked online, there was another silo across the, I-10, but that one wasn't as, uh, it was more like the desert, desert is just taken over and it was abandoned. Uh, I might try and after this, I might try and go over there and check it out, but I need to find a place to camp tonight and I'm gonna try and do some uh, boondocking out here. I am in BLM land. So let's see, here's a map. We're up north of Tucson, up here somewhere. And the, yeah, you can see the museum that I want to go to is down here. Now they have bighorn sheep out here. Lots of wildlife. All right, well, let's see. Titan two missile at the ready. Let's see here. All right, here's another map. So we are here. All right, let's, uh, let's take a walk. Wow, I guess it's getting a little bit dark out here, huh? <laughs> Come on, son. And uh, it's at the base of these mountains. These are beautiful area down here. Beautiful. This is a pretty big uh, loop right here. I don't know what we're looking at. I don't see much right here. Access portal. So from this, there's a stairway led from a desert surface. Hmm. Okay. Let's go take a quick walk here. Not honestly, I didn't realize that Arizona had missile silos. I know I, you always think about Kansas, Nebraska. Control center. 41 and a half feet. Well, yeah, they were these were meant to survive a first hit and then be able to retaliate. That was the purpose of these. So they were buried deep in the ground. Here's another pad. Oh, I can walk out there. I see a little sign. Oh, radio antennas. Oh, so this is where some radio antennas were. Okay. 
I'm going to walk out there because the square platform to your left was the base of a primary radio antenna. Hmm. Okay, so I guess over there was a, right about there was a radio antenna. And then a hard antenna. I'm going to walk out here. So this is where a radio antenna was. You can still see anchors. And there's another, there's some more anchors over here. So yeah, it was a pretty big antenna. Let's walk out here. There's some sort of ring, concrete in it. There's another one. Let's see another one of these little signs over here. Oh, oh, here we go. Let me see if the sign has anything on it. Launch Control Center. So what I'm seeing, maybe this was some sort of hatch. Hmm. There's still not a lot to see anymore. After uh, 1984, when I started decommissioning all these, they, uh, well, they put some effort into, oh, there's nothing on this sign. I'm going to head through here just to see if there's any other remnants. Head back to that trail. <laughs> I'm a little confused. There's just not, not a lot to see so I'm trying to visualize what may have been here. Yeah oh this was where the this had to be where the silo was. And these were spread out quite a bit quite a way. It's probably five or six miles, maybe more to the other silo. But there's no sign right here telling me that was the silo. I'm just kind of guessing. This may have been a hatch way to get down. Hmm. We'll go back to one of those maps so they can piece all this together, I think. So it must have been this whole thing right here. This big old mound right here. So under all these trees, maybe this was the silo where all these trees and that water is collected down in there. Now, so we're here and that mound that I saw must have been that where the silo was because where my truck is parked over there is another slab for an antenna. And they had tunnel going underneath. And then this was the first antenna that we saw with the anchors in it. And then I think we did see a hatch. Yeah, this is where we saw that hatch that took us down into the, the complex. Wow. All right, well, this was a really neat place. And it's not a destination, but it's a neat place to stop by if you're going to do something in Tucson, Tucson or if uh, it's really close to uh, probably 15 minutes from Picacho Peak. 
State Park, if you're camping there, this is a nice little thing. Yeah, truck's all packed up, ready for some more camping. So it's pretty neat, pretty neat little place. If you're looking to kill a couple minutes. The, the road, you probably saw, mostly the road is paved and the part that's not is in very good condition. Because I think this is still an active road to, um, there might be still some mining activity up in the mountains. So they probably keep it pretty good. Yeah, all right, well, I'm gonna, well, the sun's gone off my mountain, but I'm gonna wait around and see if I can't get a picture or two around here, and then I gotta find some place to camp. All right, well, I found a place to camp, and it's up near the Waterman Trailhead. So um, I don't think anybody's gonna be up here camping tonight. So it'll be all right to stay here. And then uh, I'm just gonna cook me up a little bit of something to eat. I wanna get a good night's rest because tomorrow I wanted to head down to Tucson and check out that Titan II Museum. And then I wanted to check out the, the Pima Air and Space Museum down there as well. So we'll talk to you in the morning. I was uh, pretty happy with the camp spot last night. It was up out of the way, and I got a good view of Marana, and you can see Tucson off in the distance too. And it did clear up, so I was able to get a Star Trail picture. Yeah, I'm a little excited to see this museum after looking at the, the abandoned one up in, by Marana. Uh, yeah, we're going to find out what the real one looked like. And this is the exact same thing. It's just uh, they they kept it as a museum. The, the Air Force actually owns this still, but uh, yeah, it's gonna be neat to walk down to get down and see what it what it really looked like back in the day, and not just a bunch of metal rings being rusted away in the desert. So this is gonna be this is gonna be neat. I know you can tour down below or you can just tour topside. So I'm hoping that I can be able to tour down, uh, go down into the control center. So let me get parked and we'll check it out. All right, well, I think this will be pretty interesting. And since we visited the, uh, the site down at, in the desert, I thought it'd be cool to come see an actual museum. While I'm waiting to go in, before I get in there, let's check this out. High frequency disc cage antenna. 76 feet high antenna was located outside the main compound. Uh, from a disc cage. Because it looks like a cage, that's how they can disc. <laughs> um, a worldwide communications still functional and is often used by visiting amateur radio operators. Wow, there you go. Looks like a Christmas tree. <laughs> All right, let's get inside there. Yeah, barrel cactus are starting to uh, get some color. Look at that. Watch for rattlesnakes. <laughs> All right, let's check this. So they, they are open 9.45 a.m to 5 p.m. daily. Time just a little bit to 1969 and the height of the Cold War. A few of you may be old enough to remember those days. <laughs> Five feet down that cableway to the silo itself, home of the last remaining Titan II missile on Earth. And there we will learn everything we wanted to and a lot of things we didn't about this weapon system. Now, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Assuming my technology works. I'm not going to be last. No. We're going to head out there, but I saw this diagram of what it looks like. Oh, you can see the control center, the stairs down, and you can see the missile in the silo itself. Oh, this is going to be cool. Our commute would not have been 25 yards. 
It would have been about 25 miles down a dirt road from downtown Tucson. And he's right over there at that gate where our four-man crew would have encountered their first real obstacle on the way into work. Said gate. There are no cameras up here. We have no radio. We have no cell phone. How do we get it? Well, the answer is simple. Next to that gate, there's a blue box with a landline phone inside. Driver gets out, picks up the phone. It's us. We're here. Let us in. Gate opens. The moment it opens, a three-minute countdown begins. Why three minutes? Well, that is a perfectly reasonable amount of time for us to drive in, park our vehicle, get out, grab our bags, walk across here, and down those concrete steps behind you. It is also a security feature. Let's say our crew's been taken hostage by a bunch of really angry road runners. <laughs> How do they alert the duty crew to their predicament? Simple. A nice slow stroll in this lovely Arizona way. <laughs> if it takes us more than three minutes, well, the duty crew will know something is wrong and they call the authorities. No muss, no fuss, no complicated code words or fancy dress signals. Now, seeing as we lack both angry road runners and I'm getting a little tired of staring into the sun, let's go ahead and head on downstairs, shall we? There are 55 of them. Take your time. What do we have here? Air Chef provided fresh air for control center and it served as an emergency airscape. Yeah, everybody's making their way down to the control center. So this is going to be neat. Loud. You can hear the steps down there. Wow, 55 steps. You can hear them, every one of them, too. Oh, smells like the military down here. Steps inside of our three minute time. Bottom of the steps is a phone. Man picks the phone up. It's me. I'm here. Let me in. And then he and he alone enters through that blue door into the entrapment. There, it's 35 feet above us, ladies and gentlemen. We've already gone through it. And there, under the unblinked electronic gaze of the only security camera in the entire complex, he must do three things. The first is he must remove from his pocket a paper envelope with a paper card inside. On that card is a code. He must read that code into yet another phone. Assuming everything checks out, he can let his crew in and they are through to the next round. But before he can follow, he must destroy that paper card with the ultra sophisticated method of setting it on fire and dropping it into the red coffee can you may have seen on the wall up there. The four man crew then descends 55 steps. The same 55 steps we just came down. To this lobby area and a very large and very locked door. How do we get in? Let's see who's been paying attention. One more phone call, right over there. It's us, we're here, let us in. So if everything checks out, open button is pushed, open button inside is pushed. Four massive steel hydraulic locks disengage, and the door stays shut. It is a manually operated door. Anybody want to take a guess as to how much my door weighs? Four times. You're close. It weighs three times. Six thousand pounds. And for the next 24 hours, a truly terrible responsibility will rest on our shoulders. We are, if ordered, to end life on Earth as we know it. And with that happy thought bouncing around inside our heads, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about our home away from home, shall we? As I mentioned before, we are 35 feet underground. These walls are up to 8 feet of reinforced concrete. My door is blast-proof, bomb-proof, bullet-proof, child-proof, and thanks to that lovely milled flange and a neoprene gasket, completely airtight. 
we can in fact survive a 300 PSI black swan. Let me put that into context for you. Your house will explode into match wood with 5 PSI. That is the equivalent of 900 tons balanced on my roof. Nothing is getting in here unless we let it. Well, there's one exception. A direct hit from a Soviet atomic bomb. And by direct hit, I mean within a mile of where we are standing. Wow, look at that. It's cooler down here. The gas masks. Plumbing. And that looks like everybody. <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess as to why there are big springs mounted on my walls? Exactly. Those are shock absorbers. We are in fact floating in midair suspended on eight massive shock absorbers. We can in fact bounce 18 inches up and down or sway 12 inches side to side and not even see a ripple in our morning car. No. And congratulations to two of you are now under arrest for breaking the first rule of military service. You never, ever, ever volunteer for anything. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> now before the MV show up to drag these two off to the bridge, let's go ahead and meet them. So this gentleman right here. He is our MCCC, our Missile Combat Crew Commander. Down here, he's the boss, the big kahuna, the king. But heavy is the head that wears the crown. You have three major responsibilities. The first is you are responsible for the lives of three other human beings. The second is you are responsible for this $13 million missile facility. The other thing that I mentioned up top was four. There are four crew. We've only met two of them. They are officers. The other two are enlisted personnel. Your job is done, you may release your keys and take a seat. All on you now. Three, two, one, mark. And your jobs are done, you may take your seats. There is one thing left to do. Reach into your pocket, take out a cigarette, and... Mm. Don't worry, we will all be dead of radiation long before the long cancer gets us. 58 seconds. It will feel like a lifetime. And that was our silo door opening. We're just past the half. never know if we were successful. We will never know if we hit target number two. Make of that what you will. Wow. There's another look at those big shock absorbers. Titan II missile? <clears throat> the answer is both very simple and extremely scary. Titan II is the biggest, baddest, most powerful ICBM the United States military ever deployed operationally. Our Titan II stands 10 stories tall. Wow, look at that. We can go up there and look down into it. All right. Hey, folks, I need you to start making your way back up top. That was very interesting. So that was equal to 600 Hiroshima bombs. Wow. It would annihilate 
900 square miles. Three, three, 30 by 30. Yeah. Man. I'm sure glad they didn't launch. <laughs> I, that's for sure. <laughs> and they're, they're down here for 24 hours. And they're four hours of rest in that 24 hours. And they're constantly tested. And they would uh, go through drills all day. Lots of paperwork. And uh, we don't get to go upstairs, but they had some living quarters upstairs. And uh, he said that um, there's a full, full bath, full kitchen, and there was a, a Pong machine, which I remember very well. Like you saying, uh, when you got the code and you turned the key, you didn't know where your target was. All you knew was target number two. Couple of suits. Hi. Um, how many? How many people were down here at one time? That in the LCC there would have been a four-man crew. During um, the week there would have been up to fifty men in the silo doing maintenance. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. One last set of stairs. <laughs> well, sir, this is my third tour of the day. <laughs> We're going to come check out the silo. That was immensely cool to see that. Everything, of course, like everything in the military, everything is compact, has a purpose, not much extra space, especially back then. But there were four crew members down there, like you said. So I think he said this silo is 15 stories. It's locked, partially open. And here, check these hydraulic. There's some hydraulic and it's buttressed up against a big old heavy counterweight. Silo closure door. It could be opened in 20 seconds. 20 seconds. Man, that's, that's a lot. A lot of weight to move in 20 seconds. This missile is going to weigh 300,000 pounds. See if we can find a spot. Look down there. Oh, looks like I have one here. Wow, look at this. Sorry, I'm going to try and put you up again so you can see down there. Look at the size of that thing. 16,000 miles an hour that thing traveled. 6,500 mile um, distance that it could travel. I hope you guys can see this. But here you can see the blast door, the, the top, how big that thing was. Wow. So cool. And as he was saying, once they turned those keys and it was gone, there was no turning back. All you could do was smoke a cigarette. <laughs> and I imagine that Oh man, after every test, are you gonna, what are you thinking during that test? Is this the real thing? Is this the real thing? Reentry vehicle adapter section. Wow. So for the cost, there is no veterans discount. 
Um, it's 1650 to do the tour I just did downstairs, and that includes the top side. If you only want to tour the top side, you can do that, and it's $7.50. But it looks like, I think they have a tour every 30 minutes, because I was on the 2 o'clock, and there's a 2.30 tour just coming down. So the tour isn't, what time is it? It is 3 o'clock, so it's about an hour long, including the, the video at the beginning to describe some stuff. Yeah, this place is so cool. So you can kind of see how big the complex was. It's about the same size as what we saw out there. Oh, it's just a de de <laughs> the desert took it over. But man. Oh, and he's saying, the other thing he was saying was that the uh, the missile, this missile that we just saw that's in the silo, uh, it's the only one left. They got it from Texas and it was only used for um, training maintenance. But here's like antenna sites that we saw when we were out there, and the hard pads, hatches. I said, this is a little bit better view. of the total complex. And the only thing that could destroy these things were a direct hit. Did Ethan say what the roof was? No. All right, let's go take a look inside the, since we didn't have time, I got here right at two o'clock and they just let me slide into that tour. Let's go take a look inside. Oh. Some cool museum, <laughs> t-shirts. Wow, I was debating on coming here and I'm so glad I did. There's another bomb with some this magnets on it. Got some t-shirts. And this is a re-entry vehicle. To protect the warhead from the heat. Oh, so this is what would have been uh, 7,600 pounds. So as they keep the warhead from being destroyed as it was re-entering the atmosphere at its destination. There's another console here. So this was the actual warhead. This is a nine megaton thermonuclear warhead. 900 square miles, so <laughs> Tucson, Morano, Saguaro National Park would be gone. And then you have all the radiation to worry about. All right, this was, this was so cool. Yeah. If you're down here, check this out for sure. It's worth it. It's really worth it. All right. Let's get out of here. All right, well, that's going to do it from the, uh, the Titan II Museum. That was really impressive. And uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. You could probably be in and out in, I don't know, an hour and a half. So it's, uh, it's well worth the money. And you get to see some authentic, the real thing. It's not just something that they made up. It was actually used and they just uh, kept it as a museum. So anyways, I'm gonna sign off and just remember, never say goodbye, always see you later.